Welcome to the Ag Week podcast. I'm Ag Week reporter Ariana Schumacher. Today we'll be talking about native plants and growing your own pollinator gardens with Master Gardener Ann Larson. So Ann, start off by telling me a little bit about your background and work with the Master Gardeners. Well, I've been a Master Gardener for a number of years, probably about, oh, I'd say 12, 13 years. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in horticulture and plant pathology from SDSU, and I've always loved gardening. But lately, you know, the big interest for everyone is natural gardens, pollinators. And so uh, I've been involved in, in much of that through Master Gardeners. Perfect. And we talked a little bit about pollinator gardens. Tell me what those are and what they consist of. Well, pollinator gardens are really um, made up of uh, usually native plants that are really can attract pollinators. When we say pollinators, we mean butterflies, bees, some flies. Uh, there's a lot more uh, butterflies than just the monarch, although that is the one everyone thinks about. But there's a lot of different bugs, insects that pollinate plants. And it's really important for the farmers because you know, we need to have those pollinators that pollinate the corn and the soybeans and the other kinds of uh, crops. We just kind of touched on this, but why are pollinator gardens important to the environment, whether they're in a city or out on a farm? Well, without pollinators, without the bees and the butterflies, we won't have any fruit. We won't uh, because they pollinate the fruit. Of course, not so much here, but in the southern and, and western states. But here in South Dakota, the soybeans, the corn, uh, alfalfa, um, there's just a lot of uh, plants. And in your garden, then it would be all of the other kinds of veggies. And what are some things that people should include when they are starting and building that pollinator garden? Well, they need to think about native plants, not so much cultivars. Maybe native plants aren't quite as beautiful. They don't have the, the bright blossoms, although some of them definitely do. But cultivars are usually bred to be prettier and maybe other kinds of, uh, of uh, characteristics. But the native is what they should really go for. And you can get them, some of them here in town, uh, in Brandon, and then uh, by mail order. So native, some of the ones I everyone thinks about is, of course, milkweeds. <laughs> what, what are some of those native plants that might be easier when you're starting that garden for the first time? And what are some of those ones that grow the best here in South Dakota? Well, there's the, the native columbine, and that is one that you see a lot of. It's kind of red and white. It isn't blue. It isn't purple. It isn't yellow, but it's the red and white columbine. And you need to think about maybe having some blooms throughout the season. So Columbine is kind of an early and maybe middle season. Um, we've got, there's lead plant you can get, that's mid season and it's purple and it's pretty. Um, the different clovers, the prairie clover, that's one that people see a lot, even in ditches that can grow. Sunflowers, uh, of course, um, the milkweed, but. One kind of milkweed that a person should think about, and I have a, a picture here that I was just going to pull out, a butterfly weed is actually a milkweed. And uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it is beautiful. And it, you can, they come in orange and they, um, they really spread though. We have to, <laughs> you have to kind of make sure you get the seeds. Don't let them go all over, but uh, yeah, they're really pretty. And when should people start planting those pollinator gardens here in South Dakota? I think you can probably start any time now, you know, because they are native. Uh, you want to make sure you prepare your soil. When we did the Ark Garden, which was on the west side of the Ark of Dreams, uh, it was so compacted, we had to use some gypsum and some other additives just to break up the soil because it was so hard. I, I don't think anything was going to grow in that. The first year we put... Um, we put down cardboard to suppress all of the weeds, the ones we didn't want. And then the next year, we just slowly started. We threw in a few annuals so that there was some color and people wouldn't think it was just a cardboard garden. And um, then the next year, we put in more in the next year. Now, this year, we are going to have to start um, dividing some of them. It has exploded. And what kind of maintenance does managing a, a pollinator garden require? Well, theoretically, 
it's not supposed to have any maintenance, but but you don't want the invasive weeds and the kinds of plants that you really don't want. And that will come into your native garden. So you just kind of have to watch it. Although, you know, the seedlings, if you start them, like if you throw out a mixture of seeds, you're not going to know what's what until they start coming up and blooming. So you just got to kind of watch it and then um, slowly take out those things you don't want. Um you know, you want to give them some space. But again, when we talk about natives, well, it's kind of like what grows in nature. So you don't want to have it too cultivated, but you want to introduce those plants that uh, give it color, will attract the, you know, the bees, the butterflies, uh, make sure you have some milkweed, but the tall ones you want to put in the back. And, uh, you know, those are some things that you need to think about the color, the season of uh, bloom. And when we're talking about pollinator gardens, we've talked a lot about native plants. Why is it important to include those native plants in a pollinator garden? Well, because those are the ones that grow naturally around here. So they're going to be uh, better suited. They're going to come up year after year. They're going to be stronger, more resilient. Um, although some of them may have some, the bunnies, the deer, you know, some of them may also have the natural, you know, predators, you will, so to speak, but uh, you want to include those that are better suited, better adapted to the environment. And what are your biggest tips for someone who has maybe never gardened before or is just thinking about starting a pollinator garden and doesn't really know where to start? Well, there's a lot of researchers have been looking at it. Everyone seems like they have it on their mind lately. I noticed even Sioux Falls had something in the paper recently about how you could get some kits for pollinator gardens. So, but you can go to some nurseries, they could and ask, they'll they'll give you some some native ideas. Um, talk to your master gardeners. Um, but even SDSU Extension has a lot of research, a lot of has done a lot of uh, research on that, and they actually even grow some of those plants. And I know you've done a lot of work with these pollinator gardens. What's it like to see them grow, see the pollinators? What kind of response have you seen from these gardens? Wow. You know, the, they always say that plants, especially perennials, perennials, are sleeping the first year and then they're creeping the second year. But I like to say they explode the third year because, oh boy, they did. Um, the first year it was kind of, you know, we kind of kept watching and thinking, isn't it ever going to grow? Uh, we planted the zinnias and the marigolds in front of the art garden so that people who walked by wouldn't think it was just awful, you know. But then pretty soon things just started. And now we go down even in the winter and see how, you know, there we we left some, you know, we left some plants and, and it holds the snow. And it is just amazing. It's amazing. And we see little birds hopping around in there. We see butterflies and bees. Um they're all over some of them. Seems like they just kind of attack some of them. They really love like the big garas that are in the back. That's not a common one you hear about, but they love those things. The anise hyssop, they're just all over that all the time. And there's some other things that they just love. The sunflowers, the asters, they're, they're, it's fun to watch. It's fun to see. And this has kind of become more of a hot topic in gardening these pollinator gardens. How do you expect to see that them grow over the years? See, are we going to see more popping up across South Dakota? Tell me a little bit about the outlook for these pollinator gardens. Oh, I think that they definitely will. There's a, a real a change, a real push for uh, people understand now. I think that it's more more important than ever to uh, help our our, our our I mean our bees, our butterflies, uh, because throughout the years, I don't think they've gotten a lot of attention and uh, with the sprays and uh, that kind of thing, uh, they, their populations have diminished so much that I think we'll see that more and more. I, we have seen more interest in it, and we we even talk about it when some of our, our events, we talk about how to start one and, and what kind of plants to use. So, Perfect. Well, thank you so much. You answered all my questions. Is there anything I missed, anything else that you would like to add? Well, we like to invite people to stop down to the art garden on the west, the west end of the art garden, that is. And then also uh, there's the old courthouse museum that is between the courthouse museum and the new. Um, there's a little garden in there that people come and see. Um, 
we uh, have out at uh, Mary Jo Arbor Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum. Uh, we have some some <laughs> some uh, plants out there as well, and I think um, I think that you'll see them more and more in people's gardens. I have in my corner garden. I have some sunflowers that come up and some milkweed, and I think people look at them. My father, who was a farmer, he would be probably rolling over in his grave. But uh, you know, I let them grow, and 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 I love to see the caterpillars on the milkweed, and then I love to see everything. That's just so great. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Anne, and thank you for everyone who's listening to this week's episode of the Ag Week podcast. If you enjoy this content, you can visit agweek.com slash subscribe to support our work. You can also keep up on everything we're doing with Ag Week by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, or subscribing to our email newsletter at agweek.com. And of course, you can always catch our best work in the Ag Week magazine or on Ag Week TV. Please remember to rate and review every time you listen.